It's April 18th, 1938, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. When his creators first imagined him, Superman was a baddie who had been fabricated by an evil scientist who gave telepathic powers to a homeless person. But when Superman finally came to public consciousness today in history in 1938, he was already the all-American do-gooder we know today with most of the same skills and foibles, the incredible strength, the invincibility, the hopeless crush on Lois Lane, and critically, the inexplicable penchant for wearing his bright red underpants on the outside of his costume. (laughs) Yeah, the costume was influenced by Victorian strongmen and his face apparently was influenced by Johnny Weissmuller as discussed in our Tarzan Mm, episode recently. uh, It's a 13-page story and what really stands out is that superheroes were new... He mm. has all the traits of a superhero, but they hadn't really worked out what superheroes did yet. So he yeah. uses his... Inc- it's a bit of an overkill situation. He uses <laughs> sure his incredible is. powers for oddly pedestrian purposes, like solving crimes, saving Lois Lane from a gangster, confronting a corrupt senator. By the way, all things that Little Orphan Annie did in her own comic strip. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it is amazing how many plot points there are in this first ever strip of Superman. But as you were saying, it kind of uh, created the superhero genre. You know, as we've discussed before, prior to this, really, comic strips were political and satirical cartoons for grown-ups. Or at least for the whole family, like you're saying, with Little Orphan Annie. This was for kids. But what the creators, Jerry Siegel, who wrote the strip, and Joe Schuster, who drew it, what they did really was draw upon so many elements that I was surprised at how old some of them were. I mean, the idea of having a hero with a secret identity was present in stuff like Zorro and the Scarlet Pimpernel. And there had also been earlier characters who had unnatural powers. One I thought was really interesting was from 1909. It was Loiselle, who was a newspaper serial heroine. She had this steampunk wing costume so that she could fly around the city so there was already some of that Mm. there was this one that's often cited as being the first comic strip superhero 1934 newspaper comic strip called mandrake the magician but it does depend whether you count his skill set which is stuff like hypnosis and levitation as being superpowers or magic but the inspiration like the direct inspiration was much more domestic because according to joanne siegel jerry siegel's wife she said that the inspiration was the death of siegel's father uh which inspired uh, superman himself and siegel's father died of a heart attack in 1932 during a robbery. And then he burst through the coffin and said, you can't keep me in here for long. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Sadly not, but the earliest sketches show Superman saving a man at gunpoint that looked a lot like uh, Siegel's father and also the appearance of Superman was said to be inspired by Siegel himself. You know, being a reporter, that was Siegel's original dream as a child. So he really baked quite a lot of himself into this character. Although it's worth saying that the newspaper that Clark Kent works for in this early Superman is is not the Daily Planet but the Daily Star which is amusing if you know the British <laughs> Daily Star yeah <laughs> Uh, also, other things that are different is it's set in Smallville, but not Smallville, Kansas. It hadn't been mm. uh, geotagged yet. And Superman can't fly. He yes. can leap over skyscrapers, but he can't fly. Difficult to draw. It's just an empty panel. Isn't yeah, it? right. Yeah. <laughs> but also the way he uses that skill is really interesting. I think the first, like, it's totally worth reading this first effort uh, issue. If you've got $2 million to buy it. Yeah, right. Or yeah. just look in our show notes. We'll put a link to um, the <laughs> online version that you can read for slightly less than $2 million. But I expected it to be really lame. I thought that it was going to be a, a period piece. But actually, I found myself being really drawn into the action of it. And the way he uses that power that isn't quite flying is that he he picks up this corrupt senator and terrifies him by doing these enormous jumps all over town and the senator's like, oh, my God, we're going to crash into this building or that building. So, yeah, it's like it's the, the way that he deploys his skill set is unusual at the beginning. And it was a huge success from day one. I mean, this issue had 130,000 readers, which isn't bad for a comic. That jumped to half a million circulation by issue 15. Interestingly, Superman didn't consistently grace the cover until Mm. issue 19 of Action (laughs) Comics. So it's almost like they didn't know what they had. And I wonder if partly like a reticence to promote Superman is the liberal politics. Uh, That's clearly the message here. Mm. You know, Superman is there at this stage to make things better for the common man. His targets are slum landlords. When he first asks Lois out for a date, it's after having bashed a wife-beater through the wall. <laughs> you know, it's like, 
there's even a, a strip um, a few issues on from now where he traps the boss of a mine in the mine until he commits to making it safer for his workers. There's yeah. one where he makes an arms manufacturer promise to stop making firearms. And that's probably why Superman has stood the test of time better than other Action Comics number one heroes like Scoop Scanlon, Five Star Reporter and Sticky Mitt Stimson. <laughs> <laughs> and the fact that the industry hadn't been properly established probably accounts for why Siegel and Schuster then sold the rights for Superman one month before this day in history, March 1938, mm. for $130. Yes. Ronald Wayne vibes, everybody. $130 yes. to Detective Comics, now DC, of course. And that's yeah. what they... I mean, I mean, can you imagine if they just even just ha- held on to a portion of the licensing rights for the S? <laughs> right. I mean, just yeah. the S symbol is one of the world's most recognisable symbols. Just yeah. that. <laughs> Never mind any of the characters or anything. And then one of the more popular stories that was included uh, in the sort of early period of Superman had Superman confronting Hitler and exposing the horror that was being inflicted on Jewish people in Europe. And this actually got the attention of the Nazi regime who published this piece in the weekly newspaper of the SS. And they uh, said that Siegel and Schuster were brainwashing the children of America and that there is nothing uh, the seducers, which is a Jewish aristocratic high priest, won't do for money. And the piece went on to argue that Siegel was basically pushing this Jewish uh, agenda. It said he sows hate, suspicion, evil and laziness. Nothing they won't do for money, despite having sold the rights for $130. Right. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Um, but this report being reported then back in America inspired lots of other Jewish artists to create their own comics about protecting the persecuted. Among them, Jack Kirby, who along with his partner Joe Simon, created Captain America. Yeah, well, I mean, most of the superhero comic artists were Jewish. You know, Bob Kane and Bill Finger as well, who created Batman the following year Mm. after this one too. There is a kind of Jewish reading, which is quite clear, really, that Superman kind of has these secret powers that mortal men do not have, something that only his community from outer space could give him, but he has to assimilate in America with his all-American name, Clark Kent. But just Mm. beneath his starch cotton shirt, you know, there's this this real identity. (laughs) And I do think these children of immigrants to the United States were looking for a superhero. And what makes the story universal, most of America's immigrants, right? You know, he came from an exploding Krypton to have a better life in the States, yes. but actually in his heart, he wants to go back to his home nation where things are fundamentally better. Well, I mean, Superman was used as a stand-in for America during World War II, but Jerry Siegel actually, you know, he didn't just write the strip, he took an active role in World War II himself, he was in the US Army, and when he came out of the military, he and Schuster then decided that, you know, Superman being enormously popular by this point, that maybe by giving away the copyright they had made a big mistake, they sued DC in 1947. It kind of went on for a while, but in the end they received an out-of-court settlement and they both got fired. Uh, both families, <laughs> both of their families have been involved in legal battles for decades over this. But one part, at least of it, will come to a natural end in 2033 when Superman goes out of copyright, or yeah. at least the version that appeared on this day. It's unclear yeah. whether powers that he developed later in the strips and later characters will be included in that. Well, the other funny thing is that, like, Superman kept being affiliated with different moments of, like, real-world politics. And after the Second World War, the Ku Klux Klan was undergoing a revival in the US. And as they grew, there was an activist called Stetson Kennedy who resolved to fight back. But because he wasn't getting much interest from the police, I mean, this is a a slightly nutty (laughs) approach that he took to this problem. But he decided to join the Klan in order to learn all of their secrets and operations and then look for a way to expose them. And he turned to the makers of the, by now, Superman radio show that was very popular, and he hoped that the, <laughs> like, the Sorry, people behind the that... it's just the idea of a Superman radio show. Like, I know. Picture uh, yes. me, I'm flying through the air right now. <laughs> ba-doom, ba-doom, yeah, now things are bouncing off me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, But yeah, he hoped that those creators would be willing to adapt a story in which Superman would basically battle against the Klan while also simultaneously exposing their real world lingo and secrets. And they made this 16 part story that was called Clan of the Fiery Cross. And its effect (laughs) was to demythologize the KKK. uh, And it had the effect apparently of harming their recruitment efforts. So it's, it's just weird that intersection between this fictional character and the real world. 
Can't imagine why Richard Donner wanted to focus on the origin story. Yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow. Rainier was kind of just looking for a Hollywood bride, any Hollywood bride. Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.